Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lay. There are a ton of legal things to figure out when you own a rental property. I hear a lot of the same questions over and over again from listeners, and I thought it would be a good idea to bring on an attorney today to pick his brain and figure this stuff out from an actual attorney. Jules Haas is joining us on the podcast today. He is an attorney in New York. He does a lot of real estate work out of his office in Manhattan, and he's agreed to come on the show and answer whatever questions I throw at him. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll dive right into the interview. Are you on track to achieve your financial goals? Income producing real estate is the most historically proven way to accumulate wealth and has created more financial freedom than any other means. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best turnkey cash flow rental properties. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly income. Get your free strategy session with our knowledgeable investment counselors at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Jules, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you inviting me today, and um, I look forward to uh, having this uh, time to talk to you and your audience. I'm really excited, too. Now, before we get going, I I feel like we should maybe give some kind of a disclaimer before we get into the discussion. I I know our audience is is pretty smart and they realize they're not going to be experts on the law after listening to this podcast. But is there anything else that we should maybe warn them about before we get into the topics today? Okay. Well, um, the disclaimer sort of goes as follows. Um, I'm an attorney uh, admitted to practice in New York. So really the only advice that I uh, can give really relates to New York and Certainly, with respect to our discussion today, um, what I'm going to be doing is talking, you know, with respect to general areas and not giving any direct advice uh, with respect to anything. However, uh, for the folks out there that are not uh, New York people, um, you certainly have to check with your uh, local laws and see how this applies. But a lot of the concepts um, that we'll talk about really are generally applicable uh, throughout the country, and obviously every state varies, so you have to check, as I said. Um, and if I talk about any specifics, you know, I'll refer to New York uh, and the way it's done here. Uh, so with that being said, um, you know, you can always follow up with me as far as something in New York or, you know, check with your local professional in the state where uh, where you live or where, you know, the question might be applicable. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Cause it, it, it is incredible how complex the law can be and how much it varies from state to state. But all right. The first question I have for you, it's about LLCs. And this is probably the number one question that I, I personally hear from investors is whether they should own a property in an LLC or if they should own it personally. And I imagine this is probably not a simple answer, but w- what's your opinion on this? Okay. So the standard um, approach uh, to whether or not you should own property in uh, individual in an individual format or an LLC format, some folks own it in a uh, S corp, you know, small business format as well. Uh, really, is uh, a couple of uh, reasons. Uh, first and foremost, uh, really goes to liability reasons. Um, certainly, anything that you own personally. Uh, can result in personal liability uh, if something should go wrong. So if the building blows up and somebody sues for, you know, $10 million and gets a judgment against you personally, uh, that would affect all of your assets, including the property itself. That's that's just maybe one of many assets that you own. Um, On the other hand, if the property is owned by an LLC, um, unless there's some you know, reason or basis for somebody to look past that LLC, which is very hard to do, or a small business corporation, uh, the liability is going to be limited to the assets of that company. And the assets of that company is obviously going to be that real estate or whatever other real estate that company uh, owns. Uh, There may be other uh, issues that uh, folks should discuss with their tax advisor, um, as to the form of ownership, whether it should be in a uh, corporate form or LLC form. And again, a lot depends on other things as well, because you may have partners. Um, and so all of the partners uh, can't 
or probably don't want to all own it individually, and it may be um, uh, a lot more uh, beneficial to own it through an LLC or an S-Corp, particularly if you have a number of partners or shareholders or members of the LLC. So you have to check with your tax advisor and look at the um, at these issues from your local law standpoint. Um, as far as the liability issue goes, um, it's always important, and regardless of you know what your motivation is for putting it in an LLC form or a corporate form, uh, you should always have a lot of insurance. You know, insurance is relatively inexpensive compared to the liability that you may occur, and as everybody knows nowadays. Uh, people, you know, trip on your sidewalk and they sue you for $10 million because they claim that, you know, uh, their life has been ruined. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you should always have sufficient insurance. You should have a good insurance person sit down and make sure that, that it's covered. Um, you know, uh, there's umbrella insurance out there for folks as well. It's relatively inexpensive. So, you know, you really have to think in, in those terms as well. Now, I, I know I'm probably not going to be able to get an answer out of you, but, how much insurance should somebody have? Like, is, is there maybe a, a ballpark or maybe a formula that someone should use? Well, again, it's going to be dependent on each situation and you have to speak with your insurance person. Okay. So, you know, you may have a property, you know, let's put it this way. If you have a property that's worth $100,000, you're probably not going to get $10 million worth of insurance. You probably right. couldn't, couldn't get it. Right, okay. So okay. depending on on the value of the property that you have and the level of insurance that you feel that you may need, that's going to dictate how much insurance you get. And obviously within that context, the cost of the insurance premium that you're going to have to pay. Okay. Now let's okay. say, and, and there's levels of, you know, there's different insurance. There's replacement insurance for the prop for the structure. And then there's the liability insurance that covers, you know, uh, you know, the bricks falling on somebody's head and them getting in. Right. Okay. You know, and the, and the replacement cost is going to be dictated by the, by what the replacement would be for that property. Okay. Now we, we have a lot of listeners that maybe live in one state, but they invest in another state. So if, if say, for example, someone lives in New York, but maybe they buy properties in Ohio, would you, advise them to get an LLC in New York or in Ohio where the property is? Well, that um, is a tough question to answer directly because, again, it depends on, um, you know, everyone's situation. Certainly, if you have property in Ohio, it may be um, – uh, perfectly okay to get your to form your LLC in Ohio and have that LLC uh, own that property. Um, again, you should t check with your tax advisor to see how all that's going to be reported. Um, you know, you could probably own it in your LLC in New York as well. Um, but if you're going to have multiple properties, you may want to have separate LLCs for each one. Okay. Yeah, that, that's another question that, that comes up a lot. So is, is that generally the safest way to do it, to have one property in it, to have an LLC for each property? Well, when you ha you know, your, your liability on each property is going to be limited by the value of what's in the LLC. Right. So you're never going to, you, you shouldn't have to worry about being responsible for more then that one property in that one LLC, if there's ever uh, an occasion where your, your liability exceeds your insurance. Yeah. You know, one thing that uh, a lot of listeners struggle with is, is the the LLC fees, that they vary a lot state to state. So someone that lives in California, th their annual fee is $800. So it's like for them, I, I feel bad for them because it, it almost makes it cost prohibitive. Um, like where you maybe don't want to have an LLC for each property because if, if, if you're not making a lot of money off each property, like that can really suck up your, your profit. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess it's, it's something that people need to look into, talk to your local attorney and, and figure out what level of risk you're That's comfortable correct. with. That's correct. And your tax advisor too. Yeah. Although, you know, when you think about it, $800 is, you know, a good investment. Right. You're investing in, right. In, the protection. That's true. So that's true. That's, uh, 
you know, again, it's all a cost benefit and a business decision. Right. As as to what you're doing. Now, l- let's go back to that that tenant tripping and falling and and suing you for $10 million. If now if that happened, if a tenant fell at one of my properties and sued me, I, I think my initial reaction would be to turn that over to my insurance company. Is that the right move or should I also get my own attorney? Well, the the right move is, as you said, turn it over to your insurance company uh, in the first place because that's why you have insurance. And mm-hmm. then your insurance company is going to have to make an assessment as to whether or not it's covered under the policy. And, of course, you always hope that it is because, you know, you don't want to have to uh, – a worry about you know uh, an adverse result. You want to have the insurance backing you up, right? Um, and the insurance company, of course, is going to have a lawyer uh, through the insurance company uh, defending that case. Now, that doesn't preclude you from having your own attorney representing you as well and working with the insurance company. So that's a personal decision. But then again, you're coming out of your pocket to pay your own attorney as well as, uh, you know, having the lawyer uh, for the insurance company defend uh, whatever the problem may be. But you should always do that because if you don't contact the insurance company right away and it turns out that you see that, oh, my God, you know, I really should have called the insurance company and they don't know about this right away, and let's say you wait a year or six months or a year or whatever, they may say, well, we're going to decline coverage because your policy requires that you report it to us. And, you know, it went so long now that, uh, you know, we can't, uh, we can't cover it. Right. So you should always report it and make sure that they're going to cover it to protect yourself. Now, if they're not going to cover it, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you were negligent and, and they, they think it's, it's not covered. What ballpark, how much would a defense cost? And I, I know it's probably going to vary case by case and how much work's involved, but is this something that would be tens of thousands of dollars or like $100,000? Okay. Again, that's really difficult to say because you don't know what, what's involved in any case. Right. Okay. But it could easily be tens, tens, tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. And then add those up, whatever. So... You know, it depends on the injury and it depends on the circumstance and, and what occurred. But, um, yes, it can be very expensive. Okay. And now uh, another thing that um, I hear a lot from landlords is that they are afraid of losing the house in a lawsuit. Is this something that that could really happen? Like, could there be th- that tenant trips and falls could could a landlord actually end up losing the house as a result of the lawsuit? Okay. So it's not that they lose the house per se. In other words, uh, somebody brings in action uh, for whatever. Um, uh, the judge doesn't say, okay, they get the house. What they do is the judge would or the, the court would, you know, the award would be for X number of dollars. Mm-hmm. And that X number of dollars may very well you know, in the worst case scenario, equal will be more than the value of the house. Right. And so in order to collect on the judgment, they might foreclose on the house. Okay. Okay. So they wouldn't get the house as an award, but they would get the value, uh, a value that might be equal to it and look to the house to collect it. Now, w- what if there was a mortgage on the property? So maybe the the house is worth seven fifty, but there's a mortgage for seven hundred thousand. W- would that w- would would the judge still have the power to foreclose on the property? W- and would the would the judgment well, be paid off okay. before the mortgage? Yeah, it gets very complicated. The, okay. the mortgage company has a first lien, and uh, you know, to the you know the, the the judgment creditor would be behind the mortgage most likely. And that gets into some very complex areas of local law. Okay. Okay. As far as whatever, but just understanding the concept that, you know, if somebody has a judgment against you, it can be uh, collected against or lean on any asset that is subject to that liability, you know, whether the LLC or uh, personal liability or whatever. So that's really the, the key to understand. And if some event occurs that, 
causes concern, you would then look into what the you know long term uh, issues might be in defending that lawsuit. Okay. Now, let's talk about leases, because this is something that landlords are are dealing with constantly as they're turning over properties. There's a lot of ways that people can get leases. And I I feel like these days, a lot of people are going online and finding a lease online. Are, Are those leases safe in general? Or should somebody always sit down with a local real estate attorney to review it and make sure everything in there is compliant with the law? So I can't comment on what, you know, the good, the bad, or the ugly of any online document, whether it's a lease, whether it's a will, whether it's a contract, or whatever. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, certainly there's uh, an assortment of uh, uh, legal papers out there for the use by the general public. Um, and as an attorney, you might say that my view is a bit prejudiced, but... Um, regardless of what you do, whether or not you're buying a car, whether or not you're getting a lawyer, a doctor, or you know somebody renovating your home, uh, I think it's always a good idea to sit down with somebody who has some experience in dealing with uh, the issues that are presented to know that, that what you're doing is going to reflect what your intentions and desires are and that you fully understand what the ramifications are in connection with that document. So a lease, like any legal document, can have a lot of uh, parts to it. You know, there may be options to purchase. There may be um, provisions in there with respect to a default or with respect to landlord-tenant eviction proceedings if someone doesn't pay their rent or who's responsible for, you know, uh, paying the utilities or whatever. Um, And in each jurisdiction, whether it's New York or New Jersey or Connecticut or wherever it might be, you know, there may be particular language uh, that might be beneficial or have a, a uh, special meaning uh, in landlord-tenant relations that, you know, might benefit uh, a landlord in one of these documents. Right. So at the end of the day, um, it's always good to sit down with someone who's seen these things. And even if you have to you know, incur a little bit of an expense. I think that uh, it's just a matter of of education, which doesn't mean that the document that you get online was incorrect. It's just you're paying to educate yourself as far as whether or not uh, there are uh, things in there that you may not understand and want to know more about. So it gets done the way you want it to be done. I think that's really good advice. I mean, I I really think that somebody should, it's a good idea to sit down with an attorney and, and to do it probably every year or two, because like there's always changes to the law and things are always being updated. So your law might be, your lease might be good today, but it might, might be really outdated in five years. Right. Correct. Exactly. So, you know, if I was going to lease something in a juris, in a, you know, another jurisdiction, I would probably not know anything more or less than anyone else, because I would know nothing about the, you know, the landlord tenant or lease laws in Nevada. Right. So I right. probably want someone to educate me about that. So, you know, I, I knew what I was doing, maybe five or six or 10 leases down the road. If I've done it enough, you know, then, then fine. You know, I might feel good. Okay. I don't need somebody to tell me what to do. Right. Now let's talk about what happens when someone dies. Like, so w- when you own a property, and let's say you you live in New York, but maybe we'll, we'll go back to that property in Ohio again. Well, what happens when you die? Like, if, say if you don't have a will and you die, like, what's the process? Is that very complicated, the whole probate process? Okay. So this is a very um, uh, complex area that, that folks really need to uh, focus on. Um, and I could probably spend uh, six hours alone just discussing this because I do a lot of estate work, whether it's estate planning and probate and state administration uh, here in New York. And, you know, New York is a very real estate, particularly New York City and the surrounding area is a very real estate intense place. Mm-hmm. And 
the first thing that any that that a person really needs to understand is when you own something, whether you own it in the jurisdiction where you live or you own it outside the jurisdiction where you live, is how do you own it? So do you own it in your name alone? Uh, do you own it jointly with somebody else as joint tenants? Uh, do you own it in the form of an LLC? Um, you know, or do you own it in what we call tenants in common, where you each have a, a, an equal interest? Because the manner in which you own it is going to determine how that property passes on your death. So let me give you this quick example. All right? If you own something jointly, all right, and again, I can speak specifically for New York and probably generally for the country. If you own something jointly with as a joint tenant with a right of survivorship, and one of those uh, uh, owners dies, the property is going to automatically go to the joint owner. Now, if you write a will, a will is usually going to only operate on assets that you own individually in your own name. So you might write a will and say, well, I give everything that I own to so-and-so. But if you own property jointly with a different person, that will is not going to control and the joint ownership is going to take precedence over what the will says. So the property is going to go to that joint owner. People don't always recognize this because they don't really always remember how right. they own property. And they, and they think that if they write a will, it doesn't matter. But it does matter. Right. So the first thing you need to understand that the first thing you need to uh, take an inventory of is what do you own and how do you own it? Once you know that, then you can start making decisions about how you want to plan, uh, you know, your estate and what the results would be if you pass away. Uh, so if you own it in your own name and you have a will and say, I give property X to, you know, my cousin or my wife or whoever it is, then the will in your state is going to control the property in your state. Now, just to, and I know I'm giving like tons of information here and I'm speaking fast because I know the time is somewhat limited, but just to give you um, another little example here uh, to follow up on your question. Let's say you're a New York uh, resident, really a domiciliary, which means New York is your home, and you write a will and you say, okay, I leave all of my assets to my, you know, my son, my daughter, whoever, right? You own a house here in New York and you own something out in Ohio. The will is going to be able to pass the New York property directly to your uh, beneficiary. But the property that's in Ohio, the will that's probated here in New York cannot uh, pass that property without that will being filed and reprobated in a way in Ohio, because every state controls its own real property. So what you end up with when you have a person dying with with property in their own name in multiple jurisdictions is a concept called ancillary probate. So you would have to take the New York will and basically bring what we call an ancillary probate proceeding, which means it's ancillary to the main probate proceeding, file that proceeding in Ohio with an Ohio attorney, and then the Ohio court would then issue the authority to the, to the executor the same executor, to transfer the Ohio property because the New York court cannot cannot give authority to someone to transfer real property outside of New York. Now, the difference, the difference is that if you own something in an LLC, you don't have to do that because you own a membership interest. So you're not transferring the real property. All you're doing is transferring the membership interest, which is not real property, it's personal property. So you can transfer the membership interest and then become a member of that LLC, depending on the rules and regulations of the, uh, you know, limited liability uh, company um, and the membership certificate. So you wouldn't ha necessarily have to go through the ancillary probate process. So I know that's a mouthful of stuff, but, but it, it's get it, it, get it out there. I think and, that's really good. And I, I think the, the big takeaway for me from listening to all that is it probably makes a lot of sense to sit down with an attorney to plan this stuff out before you die to make it a lot easier for your heirs, right? That That's that's 150% correct. Yeah. Because if you plan it out, at least you're going to have the ability to get it done the way you want. Right. If you don't plan it out, not only might not it happen the way you want, but you're 
your heirs or your beneficiaries or whoever it is you're trying to benefit are going to be left with a big mess. Right. And believe me, I see this in, 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 in the stuff that I deal with all the time. You know, people yeah. just, you know, don't pay attention. And, you know, then we've got all kinds of uh, issues that we got to deal with. Yeah. All right. Well, one final question I have for you. We've gone a little bit over here, but, um, but I, I, I do have one more question that I, I think people will, will be interested in is how do how does someone go about finding a good real estate attorney? Now, obviously, if they're in New York, they need to call you. But for someone that's in another part of the country, well, what are some some resources that that or some some ways that somebody could find an attorney like you? OK, well, you know, finding uh, a real estate attorney is pretty much like finding any other type of professional that you want to, uh, you know, hire. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously personal recommendations are always good. You know, who did you use, you know, to your friends, relatives, neighbors, whatever. Um, You can certainly check with local bar associations. Um, You can look online and, you know, it used to be, uh, you know, finding somebody online was like, um, you know, wow, this is a foreign type of thing. (laughs) Uh, Who who does that? Right. But nowadays everybody does. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's really like one of the first resources that people go to. Yeah. So, you know, for instance, so I have a very extensive website that has loads of information about real estate and estates and wills and all of that, um, and a blog about probate. Uh, so, you know, when you go online, you know, you, you see some site that you find interesting or, you know, seems, uh, to have the information that you want and call the person up and, speak to them and meet with them and then ultimately make a decision as to whether or not this is who you want to, uh, you know, to, uh, retain, to help you with your issue. That sounds great. That sounds great. Well, well, Jules, thank you so much for coming on the show. If somebody wants to reach out to you, if they have some follow-up questions or they want to sit down with you, what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you? Okay, sure. So, you know, as you said, my name is Jules Haas. That's J-U-L-E-S-H-A-A-S. So if you take my name and you punch it into Google, you're going to come up right to my website. And if you go on my website, you'll see, you know, you have all my contact information, my phone number, 212-355-2575. Uh, you'll see my, my website, of course, and you can always email me. Uh, my office is at 845 Third Avenue in New York, New York, New York, which is right Third Avenue, Midtown Manhattan. But I practice throughout the New York metropolitan area. And um, people call me up or send me emails or uh, you know, try to contact me all the time and I'm happy to speak with folks. And, uh, if I can help them out, answer a question, meet with them in my office, um, you know, just, just let me know and we can sort of move on from there. Perfect. And I, I will go ahead and put all of uh, Jules's information on our website. You can find it at rental income podcast.com slash episode one Oh three. Well, Jules, th- thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And thank you for listening. My name is Dan Lane. This has been the Rental Income Podcast.